Hello, my name is Warren Kenney. I have the distinct honor of being the father of the young man, I think of him as young, David Kenney, who is the regular speaker on this program. I preach for the Church of Christ in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and I have come over to do some preaching at the Church of Christ in Wadsworth on Good Avenue, and our theme is the Christian man, and I am delighted to have the opportunity to come to this studio and present some of the material that I'm presenting in those services from night to night. When we came to the end of uh, our study previously, we uh, were talking about the time that it takes to develop into manhood, and in particular, Christian manhood. And we're making the observation that the time it takes depends on where we begin. And uh, we use the illustration of driving a car. If you were driving somewhere, it might take you an hour and it might take me 10 minutes. Well, the reason for the difference is we began from different places. I began from a place much closer than did you. And the different starting point made the arrival point different. So uh, the same is true in our journey, if you please, to Christian manhood. We begin from uh, different starting points. Some become Christians, they take hold, they grow rapidly, and others are more slow and deliberate in their process. And sometimes the difference is that they began from uh, different starting points. Maybe they came from a background with good role models. Maybe they came from a good home atmosphere. And may, uh, it may just be that they avoided the uh, traps of alcohol abuse or the abuse of other kinds of drugs other than alcohol or even uh, sexual sins. And they could be compared to a young man in the scriptures whose name was Timothy, a very dear person to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul referred to him as his son in the gospel. And he said to Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, and uh, uh, her name was Lois, and uh, in your mother, Eunice. And uh, I am persuaded that it is in you also. So uh, he commends Timothy for his genuine faith, and Timothy grew rapidly as a, a Christian man because he had a good place to start. And there's a message in that for those of us who are parents and for those of us who are grandparents. And the message is we need to give our kiddos a good place to start when it comes to uh, uh, their development of manhood. We need to give them a good starting place. And it was because of that background that Timothy had that Paul could say to him, but you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And two people that he learned them from was his mother and his grandmother. And that from childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. But many people, maybe you, me, many people were not as fortunate as was this young man whose name was Timothy. In today's culture, 
Children are being raised without any religious foundations whatsoever. I don't mean to be unduly offensive, but they are like many in the first century who came from paganistic backgrounds. They come, they come from paganistic backgrounds wherein they walked in the ways of the world. On Mother's Day, just recently, we came out of the church building at Martinsburg. And we were sitting in the van getting ready to pull off. And I pointed to one of our large glass windows at the entranceway. And I said, would you look at that on that glass down close to the bottom? And my wife and sister-in-law who was with us looked and they said, what is that? I said, that's a palm print of a little child. I said, I'd love to have that as a picture. My sister-in-law, who has a servant heart, immediately grabbed her camera, jumped out of the van, and began to take pictures. I didn't know how that would all turn out because she was just taking the palm print of a child and the sun was shining on it. And thankfully it was because it reflected well. And she was able to get that picture and I wrote an article about it. And I have that article in this past Sunday's bulletin at, Martin, at Martinsburg. But I, uh, in this article, pointed out a few things that we could learn from that little palm print. And I'd like to share just a couple of them with you. The first thing we can learn is that there's a child who is fortunate enough to have parents that bring them to church. Not every child is that fortunate. There are thousands of children literally, who uh, will never have their palm prints on the window of a church building. And that makes a point that we parents, grandparents, need to consider. Everything that you see in that little palm print is an indication that there is someone who is concerned enough about that child's spiritual well-being that they make sure that that child is in church. And that makes that little palm print a work of art. And I say in the article, with apologies to the one that cleans that window, I'd like to see it covered with palm prints, just like that one. And then I made the observation that it serves as a reminder that parents have a responsibility. We bring those precious souls into the world and we are responsible for bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4, You fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we commend the parents of that child and for others like them who understand that a part of bringing those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is to make sure to bring them to church services. And hopefully they are setting a pattern for life in the life of that precious little boy and that precious little girl. I was fortunate enough to be raised by just that kind of mother. And I hope that somewhere down through the years, that little palm print will become a large palm print. And by that I mean, I hope that the fact that they were there to make that little palm print will result in them setting a pattern for life 
of worshiping God. And it reminds me that we serve a Savior who was interested in little children. Little children flock to Jesus. In Matthew 19, they uh, were fighting to bring their children to Jesus that uh, he would bless them. And of all things, the disciples rebuke them for it. And Jesus said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, verse 14. So I hope when we talk about beginning places, starting points, that you have had the opportunity to start out in a home where your little palm print was left on the church house window, a home like that of Timothy, but we uh, may have come from a life wherein we walked in the ways of the world. And then we had the responsibility of putting off concerning our former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt through uh, deceitful lust. Now, their problem is that they had old ways of thinking and feelings that had been programmed into them, and uh, as a result, they were following sinful patterns. And surely that shows that the growth to Christian maturity will be harder for some than it is for others. They have been programmed to follow sinful patterns. But I want to leave you with this point along this line, and that is our background will make a difference in the way that we grow toward Christian manhood. It'll take time for all of us to grow, but we must not allow any discouragement to cause us to uh, fall by the way. We must remember that God wants us to grow, and we cannot become discouraged to the point that we give up. He loves us. He's on our side, and with his help, we can make it. He said, through the Hebrew writer, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul, writing to this young preacher, said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The phrase, man of God, appears about 85 times in the Bible. But it's interesting, to me at least, that it's only used twice in the New Testament out of all those times. It is uh, an interesting concept. But in this passage, 2 Timothy 3.17, the word man is anthropos. Had he wanted to talk about man distinct from woman, he would have used a word like anner. Had he wanted to talk about woman in distinction to man, he would have used a term like gune. Had he wanted to use a term that was inclusive, he would have used the word anthropos. And that's the very word that he used. It just simply means human being, whether male or female. And it includes all human individuals to distinguish man from beings of a different order of animals and plants from God and Christ 
or the angels, with the added notion of weakness. In his book, When Is a Man a Man, Harold Bell Wright described the kind of man it took to endure life in the early Western United States. And he describes that man as a tough man who is by divine right his own king. He is his own jury, his own counsel, his own judge, and if need be, his own executioner. That is his definition, one that most of which I would disagree with. But I wanted you to see that in his estimation, the kind of man that it took to live in the early times of our country was a rugged individual. Although we do not need that particular kind of man to survive in today's world, we still need men. We still need strong men. We need men who know their men and who act accordingly. We are not confronted with wild pastures and untilled valley meadows in today's culture, normally speaking. Those things are things of the past, but the fact remains that the challenges that we do face represent some of the greatest ones of human history. And so uh, the crying need is still for real men, for godly men, for Christian men. And uh, the need is great and the hour is late. And how sad it is that when the need is so great, some men are confused. They are bewildered as to what it takes to make a real man. The sad thing is that this has, this confusion that is, has produced, generally speaking, men who are no longer men. Dr. Joshua Beerer, a British psychiatrist, described American men as a bunch of weaklings, what he called lily-livered sissies. I don't think he's being kind to us, do you? And he said, we, are, we should not blame the women. He said that he used to blame women, but he was driven to conclude that they're not to blame that they did not really want man's role. His words were, women are compelled to take over. They're not fighting to uh, take over. He said, we live in a day when husbands are not husbands and fathers are not fathers. A lot of fathers do not know what it means to be a father. It takes much more than the ability to father a child in the biological sense. It takes much more than that ability to make a man a father or to make him a man as far as that's concerned. I remember one particular young man, his wife presented him with a new son he was walking around the hospital and he was saying, oh, at last I'm a man. I have fathered a boy. And he abandoned that boy before that boy was six months old. It takes more to be a man than just the physical ability, biological ability to uh, father a child. That man was not made a man simply by having 
the Son. Now, look around in society, and you'll see men who are weak. You'll see men who are spoiled. You'll see men who are pampered. You will see men who are spineless, men who lack the moral, physical, and mental strength that it takes to be a man. Now the need is great, the hour is late. And I want to dwell for a few minutes on how the loss of that masculinity is affecting our society. Like it or not, many of the woes in our society that we are dealing with are rooted in a lack of manliness. Dr. Aubrey Andalon wrote a little book entitled Man of Steel and Velvet. And he shows that some of our social problems that we're facing are rooted in a lack of manliness. Our social problems are caused by the fact that men are not men. They don't know what it means to be a man. But first, before we notice some of those, let me remind you of how we were created. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. King James Version. The New Living Translation renders that like this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So he created us in his image, but he created us in a very distinct fashion. He uh, made sure that we understood that there's a difference between the boys and the girls. And I, for one, am thankful for that difference. And uh, we need to understand that there's that difference. But there are men in our society that don't understand that. They don't understand what their role is as men. But our particular interest is in Christian men. And when men forget what it means to be a man, it causes frustration in the home when he abdicates his leadership role. I have never in my lifetime seen the frustration in homes that we see nowadays. And much of it is rooted in the fact that men forget to be men. Since someone has to lead and he doesn't, often the wife is thrust into a role that she does not want. She does not want to be in a leadership role. She does not want to be, but has to be, because someone must lead. And there are a lot of jokes told about women wearing the pants in a family that are rooted in uh, the uh, fact that men refuse to accept the leadership role. And so she steps into a role that does not allow her to function as a woman. And it leaves her not being allowed to function as a womanly woman. It leaves her frustrated. It leaves her confused. And it leaves her saddened by the fact that she can't function in the way that she was designed to. But children become victims of recessive fathers. This produces an insecurity in them. Without a strong father figure, 
they are left to be insecure. Girls need a father. Boys need a father. And we have the responsibility as fathers to occupy that role for their own emotional well-being. We must be fathers. And I'm thankful that many in our society are finally coming around to admitting the truth on that. That men are actually important to uh, the lives of their children. And uh, I only wish that all men would understand that importance. I appreciate the fact that I've been able to speak to you today, and I hope the thoughts that we have presented will find lodging in good hearts and bring forth fruit that grows into Christian manhood. Thank you. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver, and that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we